Welcome to the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. I'm your host, Jacob Cooper. Uh, for those of you who are new to my channel, we love having you. Welcome on. Please make sure to hit that subscribe button. You can find us on all platforms. But today, let's get right into it. On the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder, we're going to be having on, you know, world-renowned New York Times best-selling author, Dr. Eben Alexander, on as my guest. And Eben's going to be our guest here on episode 19 on the Wisdom Jacob's Ladder. I'm looking forward to hearing about, you know, Dr. Alexander and his near-death experience, his wisdom from it, his current work. And I know it's going to be a really, truly wonderful conversation. So without further ado, we welcome Dr. Eben Alexander. Dr. Eben Alexander, thank you for being my honored guest here on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. It's just a pleasure, uh, you know, to have you on my channel. How have you been? Well, I've been doing great, Jacob, and it's good to see you again. I know we met at that uh, Colorado Ions meeting a few years ago, and uh, okay. it's great to be on with you on, in your podcast here to share with your audience a yeah. lot of what happened to me. Well, I have to thank you for your work. You know, I know my parents are not so interested in the near-death stuff, but they're more religious people, and they have come up to me. And I told them, you know, that I'd be interviewing you. They're like, oh, my God, we listened to one of his tapes in one of our trips. So you're reaching, you know, so many people on a mainstream level. And I just have to thank you for the work that you do and how many people, you know, you have reached and the lives you've changed. And I know that you had a profound near-death experience, but I wanted to, you know, scale that back a little bit to really discuss what Dr. Eben Alexander was like before your NDE, because to me, that your transformation is incredible. So if you're comfortable, could you just, you know, really tell our viewers a little bit about yourself before your NDE and what your life was like a little bit before in your belief well, systems? Absolutely. And I think it's important to point out, first of all, that I was very much influenced by my father. Uh, he uh, played a tremendous role in, in kind of my understanding of the world. He was a globally renowned neurosurgeon. Now, this is my adoptive father because I was adopted at age four months. And uh, that's an important part of my story. But uh, for the current discussion, uh, mainly to point out that he had always been very scientific, uh, was fully up on physics, chemistry, neuroscience. Uh, you know, he was a chairman of a neurosurgical training program. Now, he always had a very strong belief in God that he had garnered from his own father, who took him to the Presbyterian Church in eastern Tennessee every Sunday when he was growing up. In fact, I still have at my bedside the little pocket Bible, uh, New Testament and Psalms that my father had in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Uh, he was there for over two years in uh, uh, New Guinea, Philippines, and then finally up into Japan as a combat surgeon in the Army Air Force. And I think that uh, uh, his religious beliefs uh, and his strong belief in the reality of God and power of prayer is what got him through that conflict relatively unscathed. Now, then he came back, headed up a neurosurgical training program, very scientific, but he took me to church, that Methodist church in North Carolina, every Sunday of my life. I wanted to believe uh, what uh, you know, my father believed so fully and what I was being taught in that church. And yet as a practicing neurosurgeon, especially one who grew up in the 60s and 70s and then trained uh, in the 80s, uh, you know, I wasn't sure how in the world conscious awareness could survive the death of the brain and body. I really bought in hook, line, and sinker to the conventionalist teaching that the physical world is all that exists. You know, something, this philosophical position is physicalism or materialism that only the material world or the physical world exists and that therefore the brain must be mustering consciousness out of purely physical matter. I didn't understand how it worked, nor did anyone else. And, uh, and yet we all subscribe to this kind of myth that the brain creates consciousness and the physical is all there is. And that's why I think my near death experience was such an incredible gift. Uh, it came packaged as a perfect model for human death of, you know, by being so destructive to the human parts of the brain, the neocortex. Uh, and to me, that, uh, that is what really opened uh, uh, kind of my eyes to a deeper reality. It's the reason that the scientific community has taken my story so seriously is because of all that evidence of the damage to my brain. 
uh, and how that brain could not have harbored any kind of dream or hallucination, much less those profound, detailed, memorable, transformational, uh, and meaningful set of experiences in my entire life that occurred while my brain was demonstrably offline. And this is not just according to my findings in the book Proof of Heaven, but there's also a medical case report written by three doctors not involved in my care, but fascinated by my recovery. That came out in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease in September 2018. And the most important takeaways from that case report for the lay public, uh, one is they confirmed that my brain could not have had any kind of dream or hallucination. And therefore, where did this experience come from? Uh, and second, and this is extremely important, is how do you explain my recovery? Because any doctor who looks at me today, uh, you know, as a 69-year-old uh, man who was 15 years post severe coma due to uh, bacterial <laughs> pneumoencephalitis, uh, you know, how do you explain all this perfect recovery? It really defies uh, Western medical explanation. In fact, the peer review editors of that journal challenged the uh, authors of the paper. How do you explain this recovery that's unprecedented in the medical literature? And they simply said it's because he had a near-death experience. And they knew of other similar cases of profound recovery, like Anita Morjani's healing from her lymphoma um, after an NDE, or Mary C. Neal's healing from an over 30-minute warm water drowning while kayaking in Chile. So these, their examples in mine, and there are many others in the ND literature, really an in, inexplicable coming into wholeness and healing through a profound spiritual journey uh, while near death. Uh, so for the me before coma, who was basically a card-toting reductive materialist neurosurgeon who believed the brain creates consciousness, uh, I've come to realize that all these beautiful experiences that people share of, you know, higher realms and the spiritual world are showing us just a, a vaster aspect of this universe. Uh, and that it's not simply this little material world we live in and these bodies birth to death, but that there's far more to our existence, to kind of our soul line, to our interconnections. And this is where life starts to gain a tremendous amount more of meaning and purpose. Uh, so that uh, NDEs can really awaken us to this eternity of soul concept, which is something that Karen and I often talk about and certainly covered in a lot of detail in our uh, third book, Living in a Mindful Universe. Uh, but, you know, the me from before coma has changed radically uh, 180 degrees from that former materialist position to one now acknowledging the fundamental uh, kind of role of mind over matter, of spirit over matter, as Karen keeps reminding me. Uh, and spirit is just the word that reflects that our, our mental, uh, our minds are all connected as one and really connected with the mind of the universe. And this is where we start to learn that we have a tremendous amount of influence on our emerging reality that for me is great cause for optimism. You know, when I, when I sit back and I'm, and I'm hearing you, um, you know, from one end of year to another, you know, not only did, you know, your body, you know, you know, was close to near death or crossed over, but it seemed like your ego, the worldview that you that you had was totally rocked. And you were trained in Harvard, you know, medical school, from my understanding, your father came from this viewpoint. You know, I find when I do a lot of my work as a therapist or, you know, workshops, I think what's hardest for people is to go on a limb and to challenge their worldview. Do you still, you know, even though you had an NDE, do you still continuously have that same framework where, yes, I experienced, you know, this NDE, but I'm also, you know, humble in the fact that I don't know it all and each day is an opportunity. And for listeners who may be stuck in the worldview, what pieces of wisdom could you share on expanding their box of reality that they see it? Because it's a very vulnerable act to do to challenge everything that we know and to say, we just don't know what we think we know. Well, there's a quote in the book, Proof of Heaven. It's uh, from Rene Descartes, the renowned uh, French philosopher of the, of the I guess, 17th uh, century. Uh, and he basically said, if you would claim to be a true seeker in this world, at some point in your life, you must abandon all belief that you have any understanding of reality. Now I'm paraphrasing, it's not those words right. exactly, 
but he made it clear that you really have to let go of your worldview if you are truly a seeker. And that's because our worldviews are kind of built up from childhood, from our early experience. And in fact, I would say there's plenty of evidence given the bigger picture of all this, that our worldviews come in somewhat prepared uh, before we're born. And that is an acknowledgement of all the evidence for reincarnation uh, out of University of Virginia, et cetera. Uh, but you can't understand any of this unless you understand that we've all been here before, we come back again and again, and that this is a process uh, of really growth, of the evolution of all of consciousness. Uh, and so in so many ways, uh, I would say that this kind of revolution, it, it humbles me tremendously to have been through this. But I realized when I came back to this world that I had to question everything I ever thought I knew about the nature of reality and start over at square one and start building up the evidence from first principles. And that's where it starts to, to become very apparent uh, that this notion of primordial mind, that we're sharing the mind of the universe, that uh, through our mental faculties, especially when you realize all their interconnection uh, and, and start to label them as the spiritual faculties, um, that's what really allows us to come into this deeper understanding. Uh, and it's very comforting and reassuring. But uh, what I would uh, tell people is, for example, in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, we have many different lines of evidence. And that's the problem. So much of our kind of worldview has been hinged on various experts and specialists. And the problem is very few are actually expert or specialist in the nature of reality. Uh, you know, in, and I would uh, advise everyone that that uh, reality is the inside of our own consciousness. You know, we've got this kind of illusion that the physical world out there is what we're studying. And yet it's really our perceptions of it and kind of the integral knowledge of all this. That's what we're really studying. And that's where you start to realize that materialism and this notion of the ego mind and uh, that brain creates consciousness is false. And all the evidence for that, for example, uh, in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, it comes in the form of consilience, where we take things like quantum physics and all the evidence for the founding fathers of that field to claim that consciousness was primordial in the universe. And then we take neuroscience and the hard problem of consciousness, which is actually an impossible problem for materialist science to try and explain conscious phenomenal events emerging simply from the actions of physical matter interacting. And then we go to philosophy of mind and the apparent binding problem you know, the apparent unity of consciousness within the individual, very difficult to explain from a materialist, you know, multi-neuronal population standpoint, but very simple if you realize that consciousness is unified from the get-go, as it comes in filtered by the brain. And we have this little eddy current that we call our own consciousness, but ultimately it's part of that greater one mind consciousness. And then, of course, contributing to this consilience of evidence for primacy of consciousness is all the work from parapsychology, all the evidence for telepathy, remote viewing, uh, near-death experiences, shared death experiences, which are just like near-death but happen in perfectly healthy, normal people, usually loved ones who might be a thousand miles away from the person who's dying. Um, and then, of course, all that evidence for uh, reincarnation through the studies at UVA and uh, others, Jim Matlock, Carol Bowman, uh, but UVA and now Jim Tucker uh, with uh, more than uh, 2,700 cases they've studied of past life memories in children over the last six decades. And of those, 1,700 are solved. In other words, they found the person who the child claims to be. And when you take all of this gigantic body of scientific evidence and start to look at it, as we do in the book Living in a Mindful Universe, you realize that there is a unification of science and spirituality that is coming to this world. And that the old, dark and bleak fiction of materialism that are all separate from each other and that there's no meaning or purpose to any of this is false. And that this bigger, broader view of the scientific revolution and the understanding of consciousness is what really revolutionizes this whole picture. Uh, and I have great uh, hope and a uh, sense of harmony for this world at large as we come to realize that this scientific evidence for primacy of consciousness is really showing we're all in this together, bound through the forces of love, kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance, when necessary, forgiveness. These are the rules of this new kind of understanding of the world. And the tip of the spear in that understanding is the near-death experience community. 
NDE community, uh, like the International Association of Near-Death Studies, IANDS.org. People can go there to learn a whole lot more. But uh, really, we've moved far beyond NDEs because of this multidisciplinary approach to understanding it to greatly clarify what NDE, the message NDEs are trying to teach us. Wow. wow. Fascinating. Dr. Alexander, um, I know you wrote, written a book, which you've mentioned, Living in a Mindful Universe, which depends on what we're looking for. As we say, perception is reality. And if we are tuned into this, you know, we could start to see the shift. And I'm sure from you, when you started, you know, talking on Larry King and, you know, all that stuff to where it is now, where everyone's talking about this stuff, there's, there, there's a shift. But at the same time, you know, we, we can't deny the schism, you know, in the partisanship that that's occurring, not only here domestically, but throughout the world. And so what do you feel is a task at hand for humanity to start to put the rubber, you know, onto the onto the road as to really living closer to a more connected, mindful universe? What are some of the foundational tasks at hand that you feel that we need to do? Because that ideology sounds great. The reality is, is, you know, it's very divisive and it's not all, we're not all there right now. We're, we're not all there and that's correct. But uh, in fact, it's this awakening in the scientific understanding of uh, consciousness and how we're all in this together and connected through that mental or spiritual layer of the universe. That's where a tremendous amount of peace and harmony will come to this world. Uh, now, there has been progress, as, as you mentioned, over the last decade in particular, uh, a tremendous amount of progress in the scientific understanding of this. But I will point out that not only is it important for the scientific community to get on board, which they are, because the evidence all leads in one direction, that is to primacy of mind and this kind of unifying spiritual principle. But also note that these experiences that we talk about, and that includes not just near-death experiences, which are probably have occurred in about 5% of the North American and European population, um, but also the many examples of shared death experience, as I mentioned, uh, which are extraordinary. And as you study them, you start to realize there's no other answer but the fact that we live in a spiritual universe and we're beginning to discover uh, the deep principles of that completely. Um, but also there are things like after death communications. More than half of our modern population has experienced uh, an encounter uh, with a loved one who's left the physical plane that is so strong that it causes them to start to realize that their ongoing relationship with a loved one uh, is important and is actually uh, alive and well in real time, that it's not imagination or wishful thinking, but that our loved ones in spirit form are still there to advise us, to be with us, to serve as guides. Um, and once you realize the power of that whole after-death communication or ADC community, uh, that's when the world start, is starting to really wake up. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the evidence, for example, from the hospice community. The recent book from Dr. Christopher Kerr of Buffalo Hospice, uh, Death is But a Dream, an extraordinary book that deals only with hospice and those who are dying and yet confirms completely the stories we hear in the near-death experience community. You often hear the complaint from skeptics, well, wait a minute, if you didn't die, how are we to assume that what you went through shows us what happens when people do die? Well, that's where Dr. Christopher Kerr's work is so absolutely important. There are others who have pointed this out before. Uh, Maggie Callanan, for example, is a nurse who... Uh, wrote a book on final words that I think has been very important at, at purveying this idea of the after-death communication uh, but and deathbed vision and all of that. But Christopher Kerr's work uh, allows kind of a prospective medical scientific approach to it. And his work supports fully what we see in the NDE community. In fact, uh, from Dr. Kerr, he says that 89% of his patient population in the hospice uh, and terminal care 89% of them have an experience of either a deathbed dream or vision in which they connect with the soul of a loved one in some fashion that shows them the ongoing connection uh, that is very reassuring. And interestingly, of those 89% of his patients who have such an experience, 99% of them 
say it's more real than real, just like a near-death experience where uh, it's more real than a lived experience. And these memories outlast many of the memories of our lived experiences of life. These are not imagination and wishful thinking, as you know, the skeptic in me would have claimed before my NDE. Uh, but also I'll point out that most of those skeptics uh, out there in the scientific community in many ways are pseudo-skeptics. In other words, they've already made up their mind. They don't care about empirical data. They don't care about rational argument. Uh, and they know that materialism is true and that all this woo-woo nonsense about near-death experiences is false. Well, that's because they have fooled themselves and they're not following the evidence. And in the current era, anyone who wants to learn the answer to the afterlife question can go to BigelowInstitute.org. Uh, there was a contest held in 2021 uh, and BigelowInstitute.org is the repository for the 28 winning essays in that contest, all from investigators showing more than five years of research experience in the afterlife question. And those 28 essays all won monetary prizes in 2021. And each and every one of those essays is a powerful demonstration of the reality of the afterlife and even of reincarnation in many of those cases. Uh, and that evidence is there. So moving forward, you know, a pseudo skeptic can claim they're unwilling to review the data, but don't let them tell you that they know uh, the data is false if they haven't reviewed the evidence at BigelowInstitute.org because it's overwhelming evidence that the reality of the afterlife and reincarnation is something the scientific world is now taking very seriously. I think that's very helpful for people to just see this as not woo-woo, but I think people like you, our friend, Dr. Raymond Moody, Dr. Brian Weiss, you know, all of these things, all these people with credibility, um, you know, academic backgrounds will help out people who have questions because there's a lot of credibility and grounded foundation within your work. You know, when I sit back and I hear you, when I look at your story, um, I, I see the brilliance of God. You know, it almost seems like this couldn't, you couldn't have been a better person on paper to have what you had because you're this neurosurgeon, you have this NDE and your near-death experience is almost allegorical of the work that you do, where you are now able to relate to both sides, where you were once that skeptic to now having, where you, we all have a knowing in us, but we forget that and we come back to it. And so that, that just fascinates me, but it's also, you know, I know we both have religious backgrounds and it kind of reminds me of um, your story before you had an NDE was a was a dark time from what I understand it's several years of darkness and always my it almost reminds me of God when you know in Genesis there was darkness and you know God said um let there be light kind of thing and I think any spiritual master you know they experience it they can experience this dark night of the soul and they experience this light but could you touch upon how you know your NDE transformed you know, your life and how people could relate to the darkness, you know, that they may have in their life, because I know belief does work well with uh, grief. Uh, but how could people transform and transcend their lives when they're facing darkness? Because I know for you, and that you could share it a lot better than I could, there was years of heavy darkness leading to your NDE. And uh, even during it, maybe you could I don't want to have the full, but whatever you feel comfortable disclosing, I know our viewers will really sure. benefit from that. Yeah, that, that's a very important point, Jacob. And I think uh, it's one, another reason why proof of heaven and kind of my experience has been helpful to a lot of people is because I had, you know, some pain and darkness in my life from before. Uh, for example, at age 11 days, I was given up for adoption by my birth mother. She was unwed, 16 years old. And, uh, uh, it wasn't like she wanted to give me up, but I was not eating. I had failure to thrive. I was hospitalized by the social workers. And, but my birth mother was unwilling to sign the papers to give me up. So I got stuck in purgatory in this baby dorm uh, in the children's home in Greensboro, North Carolina, where I lived for four months before my mother finally signed the papers to let me uh, be given up for adoption and formally adopted. Um, and then, of course, so I spent much of my life, I can tell you, as an adoptee, I, I couldn't have been more fortunate, I adopted a wonderful, loving family. They honored all my hopes and dreams. But as any adoptee will tell you, that little smoking crater of being left behind by your birth mother uh, is quite a trauma in deep, very deep in your psyche. 
And for much of my life, that presented as kind of a subconscious doubt as to whether or not I was worthy of existence. You know, if my own birth mother had left me behind, uh, my, my uh, ego self was sensing uh, at a deep kind of subliminal level that maybe I didn't even deserve to be here and didn't deserve any love in this world. So I kind of struggled back and forth with trying to justify that uh, I was worthy of any love I received, but also kind of challenging the world, like, are you sure? Uh, and, uh, you know, bundled into that adoption abandonment wound uh, was the fact that I, I was uh, quite dependent on alcohol early in my career. Now, it was never an issue with my, uh, my work uh, in neurosurgery, but on my nights off call, uh, you know, I tended to lean pretty heavily on that scotch. And uh, in 1991, uh, my family and I decided it was time for me to stop drinking. So when I look back on it all, some people might see that alcoholism as a hardship. I see it as a gift. And I see my abandonment wound as a gift. And it mm -hmm. turns out that uh, in that abandonment uh, uh, adoption story, uh, in the year 2000, I was uh, challenged by my older son, Evan IV. He had a school project in family genealogy. And he challenged me to find out more about my birth family. Now, I had not contacted the children's home in several decades. But now in 2000, it was time to reach out again. I wrote another letter. Any evidence my birth mother is out there? Uh, and I expected to get the same answer as always. No, she's not looking for you. Forget about it. That's not what happened. Uh, I describe this in the book, Proof of Heaven, but driving through a, a blizzard, going skiing with my son, Evan the Fourth in February 2000, um, I remembered, oh, yeah, the social worker said to call her that afternoon. It was a Friday uh, and that she might have some answers. So I called her up and she said, well, I do have some answers. Are you sitting down? Well, I was driving through a blizzard, but I was sitting down. She said, your birth parents got married. I cannot tell you what a complete life-changing shock that was to me to hear those words. They got married. And she said, there's more, at which point I did pull over to the side of the road. She said, they had three children, but your youngest sister died two years ago. That would have been 1998. And because of that, they're still grieving her loss. It's not a good time to come back in their lives. Two-minute phone call. I hung up. My life was changed forever. I realized I had a full biological family out there. Uh, I was not part of that. Uh, and for the next uh, eight years, really, it was a dark night of the soul. I stopped taking my sons to church, stopped saying prayers to them at night. I gave up on my own belief in a loving person of God and the power of prayer that had been so strong in my father. Uh, I just let those go because that perceived rejection from my birth mother, you know, at age 54 was, if you read the adoption literature, you'll find out another uh, abandonment by the birth parents uh, in adult age for the adoptee can be devastating. And it really sent me into that dark night of the soul. And many aspects of my life started to unravel. Uh, there were more challenges to my marriage, more challenges in my career. All this stuff just started uh, crumbling. Uh, and then it was uh, seven years later, one year before my coma, that walking on a beach in South Carolina, two of my three adopted sisters said, well, don't you think it's time you reached out to your birth family again? Now, of course, my first thought was no, because I remembered what a deep abyss that had kicked me off the cliff into back in the year 2000. But they were right. They could sense there was still a hole in my soul and that I needed to try to fill it. So I wrote another letter to the children's home. And this time I got a positive answer. Uh, and so on October 5th of 2007, I walked down a sidewalk in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And for the first time in 54 years, I hugged my birth mother. Wow. And a few minutes later, I hugged my birth father that weekend. I met my uh, surviving brother and sister from that family. And then in coming months, met many other aunts, uncles, cousins, etc. Every bit of that has been a joyful reunion, incredibly powerful for me. And of course, uh, all that happened before my coma, because the coma journey absolutely necessitated that, that, uh, that I had that connection with the birth family so that I could then begin to dive deep into the additional soul connections. Uh, and those who've read the book Proof of Heaven will, of course, realize how important uh, that beautiful guardian angel on the butterfly wing in my spiritual journey was in my identify, identifying the reality of the experience and also uh, coming to sense the much deeper lessons that I was to learn 
from my NDE and bringing me back to this world. And every bit of it has been a tremendous gift. And as I said before, I had to at one point doubt everything I ever thought I knew about the nature of reality and start all over again. But this time coming in with a much more uh, useful and uh, applicable worldview, and that is of idealism, of the primacy of mind over matter. Uh, and that's really where we go in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. It's where the, the true answer lies is somewhere in that direction of primacy of mind in the universe. And that we're really sharing the mind of the universe. That's the important thing to get. That God mind, that creative force uh, behind our very existence that also still has, plays a tremendous role in how events unfold in our lives. Uh, this is uh, what we can all come to learn through meditation, centering prayer. Because one of the deepest lessons from my journey is you don't have to die or almost die to get this. As a sentient being, you can explore consciousness, centering prayer, uh, meditation. And for those who need a new tool for deep meditation, who have trouble with that monkey mind voice in their head, chattering away, preventing them from meditating, I recommend Sacred Acoustics. <clears throat> SacredAcoustics.com is a very powerful differential frequency brainwave entrainment tool that I use on a daily basis for returning to my NDE. And I've been doing that for more than a decade now and highly recommend it to people uh, as a tool for spiritual growth and understanding because ultimately the only way to come to this kind of knowing is through personal experience. And that's why developing a strong practice of meditation can be very beneficial for each and every one of us. Wow. Yeah. And I definitely want to get into a little bit more of the tools because I know, and you know, as an end of year, people like to hear their stories, but then they come back thinking, wow, you've had this. I can't do that. I, or how do I have a self-induced near death experience? And I know, and you know that near death experiences can be a double-edged sword where yes, there's the euphoric elements of it and the mystical experiences, but there's also a great deal of trauma and complexity that it can contribute early on until you make sense of it all. So it, it is a lot, but when I hear you speak, it reminds me of my NDE that I had within a playground and almost a clear reminder that no matter how disenfranchised we feel from God, we are all just God's children playing this playground. And, you know, none of this is, you know, who we really are, our bodies, you know, it's all just an experience, but our true home you know, is over there. And I'm wondering for you, if that's something that you really needed to, to learn in your NDE, that you were worthy, you are worthy, you are incredibly more significant, and you can never be dispelled from the kingdom of God, that you're forever a child of God, What, no matter what this world will tell you. Don't believe the hype, as public enemy would say, right? You know, so right. is that something that you learned? And also, what were some of the other uh, takeaways that you have from your NDE that have changed your life, would you say? Well, I think your original point that we are all children of God and in this beautiful playground is absolutely right on target. Uh, and the, the important thing that our kind of materialist culture has missed the boat on is the sense in which we are truly together in this and that we're all here to take care of each other. Uh, that's ultimately the lesson and that the best way to receive the love of the universe is to serve as a conduit of that love uh, to help our fellow beings. And the more we can get rid of this very toxic, egocentric uh, kind of me focus, which is uh, very frustrating to live with and, and certainly doesn't lead to much of a, a great sense of purpose and meaning in life. But as we expand that, uh, and the lessons of NDEs are right there to help guide us into this. Uh, but really to understand that love that we share for each other, that binding force of love. And of course, that's one of the most critical aspects of the near-death experience, especially when you look at life reviews. You know, life reviews have been reported in 25 to 50% of NDEs, uh, and depending on whatever se series they're in. Uh, but the life reviews are not some new age concept. They go back at least to the time of Plato, 2,400 years ago. He wrote about Armenian soldier Ur killed in battle, who when he came back uh, to life on the funeral pyre before they lit it up, he told his fellow soldiers that when you die, your life flashes before your eyes. And the only important thing is how much love you've managed to share with the world. 
that from a dead Armenian soldier 2,400 years ago. And you might get a similar story off of any modern battlefield today or uh, off of, you know, in, at, anywhere in that near-death experience community, uh, these kinds of stories uh, of connectedness, uh, of the binding force of love, the most universal ingredient in near-death experiences across all cultures is reconnecting with souls of departed loved ones. Uh, and also important to note, and this, this is information that comes from Bruce Grayson's recent article in the Journal of Nervous and, uh, I'm sorry, the Journey, uh, Journal of Near-Death Studies in the, in the autumn of 2021, he wrote an article uh, that covered life reviews and in around 700 patients, he said uh, uh, something, uh, something like 74% uh, of them experienced life review as from the perspective of others around them who were part of those events in their life. So in other words, it's not just your life review. It involves the events of your life, but often from the emotional perspective of those around you. So if you're busy handing out pain and suffering to others, in your life review, expect to receive that, be on the, the business end uh, and receive that uh, pain and suffering to see what it feels like. That's why the life review in many ways is the golden rule written into the fabric of the universe. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Because in a life review, we definitely feel how we've been treating others. Uh, and for me, that has been a very important lesson to learn more and more about that. I could not have an Eben Alexander personal life review because one of the unusual ingredients of my NDE was my amnesia. But that amnesia was absolutely critical. I had no memories of Evan Alexander's life, of humanity, of, of Earth, of this universe. Uh, and I came to realize in the months and years after my coma that that amnesia was absolutely essential to my buying into the reality of the experience. If, it, if I had scripted it and it had been kind of a standard story, first and foremost, my adoptive father would have been there. He would have been my guardian angel. And yet he was nowhere to be found. And as I describe in the book, Living in a Mindful Universe, I did encounter his soul several years later. And he mm -hmm. made it very clear to me that he could not be apparent to me, as he put it, a double entendre, his sense of humor. He couldn't be apparent to me during the NDE, because if he had been, in spite of the one in a million diagnosis of this E. coli meningitis in an adult and one in a billion recovery, if he had been my guardian angel, I would have been a little more tempted to dismiss it. Oh, you see who you want to see on the way out. And that's why it had to be someone who was deeply important to me in my, my life journey. And yet I had never met her and had no idea who she was when I first encountered her in the NDE. And yet I knew her so deeply because we shared a mind meld where her mind and knowing and emotional truth directly influenced my own understanding. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are cared for. And that was her message to me on that butterfly wing deep in the coma. And yet it was receiving a picture in the mail four months after my coma that helped me to realize, oh, my gosh. And it's like she was looking at me as if to say, do you finally get it? Uh, and yes, Betsy, I do finally get it. All of that is explained much more fully uh, when people read the book Proof of Heaven. But uh, um, it really, to me, was an extraordinary uh, vision and kind of collection. And it takes me back to what you said a few minutes ago about the kind of power and mind of this God force and what it does to educate us and illuminate, illuminate this deep reality for us. The stories that it lets us share uh, are just uh, amazing. And uh, the beauty of it all and the sense of humor in that in that kind of God mind uh, yeah. that yeah. shows yeah. profound realities. Could you, could, I, I, I know for viewers, you said something just so beautiful, but could you repeat that lesson that she told you just one more time regarding how loved you are and how loved others are? That's so important to hear, uh, uh, if you don't mind. To, it, to me, it was uh, really the central message of my journey that I was to bring back to this world. But when I first encountered uh, that beautiful guardian angel on the butterfly wing in, the, in what I call the gateway valley after ascending up from the kind of murky depths of the earth where my view uh, in this brilliant ultra real world that was filled with uh, kind of an idealized beauty of the earthly realms, but also filled with spiritual energy, uh, swooping mm -hmm. orbs of angelic choirs and all of that. But on that butterfly wing, that guardian angel looking at me with a look of pure love, 
Uh, mm -hmm. She never said a word. She didn't have to. But as she looked at me with those sparkling blue eyes, her message to me, which I believe is the message to the world at large, you are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are richly cared for. Uh, and the other thing that uh, I said in the book, Proof of Heaven, at that point is you can do no wrong. And I wish I'd explained that a little more in the moment because in the ears who read that realize that by already being in that beautiful, infinitely loving uh, part of the universe, uh, that what it means is you can have a life review there. You can go through all the things you did, but uh, the more they hew closely to this beautiful, loving kindness and unconditional love, the more ideally they reflect your optimal pathway forward as a soul on a soul journey. So in other words, if we choose love, compassion, kindness, mercy, acceptance, forgiveness, if those are the principles that guide every one of our actions, we have a relatively effortless way forward in terms of our soul growth and learning and teaching with our fellow souls. But we have the free will to do otherwise, to treat people with, to be greedy, to be selfish, to be mean and uh, spiteful of others, vengeful, what have you. Uh, every bit of that uh, is allowed, and yet it just shows us, uh, you know, a much more arduous and difficult pathway forward. Because what we learn is what we hand out to the universe is what the universe gives back to us. And if you hand out a lot of pain and suffering, that's going to be your lot in life. That's what comes back to you. And yet, if we serve as a conduit for that love and share all that love and grace and kindness and compassion and take care of others, take care of the least, the last and the lost. Uh, make sure we share that love of the universe, that binding force of love in all of our actions with our fellow beings. That includes not just humans, but with our animal friends and with the world at large. We need to be better stewards of this planet. But these are all the deep and profound lessons of oneness, togetherness, kindness uh, and caring uh, that I think are essential for our modern world to understand because the NDE community shows us very clearly these are fundamentally part of who we are and part of where this world is headed. Our belief in what you're describing, our belief of God in the afterlife is so instrumental in our behavior, in our conduct. And I think that's so profound about NDEers. We're firsthand uh, experiencers of this truth in this reality we come forward with maybe different messages you know that hey that god isn't your you know abusive narcissistic school principal or parent you know it is an all loving energy and that is the dna of ourselves and we have to sometimes lose ourselves which you did in order to remember who we are and i think it's about remembering who we really are um that's that's significant people ask me all the time um, you know, what happens when we die? And I have a hard time speaking for each individual. Certainly, I could chronicle a lot of characteristics of NDEs that have happened and some of the steps that have happened in mine. But how do you view the average afterlife? Are there object, you know, are there general frameworks that happen? Or is it mostly just subjective experiences from what you chronicled? And also, what are some of the mystical experiences that people have and that you connect to of the afterlife, would you say? I'd say the most important ingredient to uh, recognize is that that realm, that spiritual realm, is in many ways timeless. It is not stuck in earth time. Earth time is something that is apparent to us when we're in these bodies. Um, you know, in earth time is how we kind of tell the narrative of our unfolding lives and kind of experiences. And yet in that realm, it should be obvious when you hear about people having life reviews and the life review is not only from others perspective, but the life review is more of a reliving of events than remembering of events. Uh, and that's where you start to recognize the power of that realm. If we can have birth, death, everything in between, even glimpse into past lives and future lives, uh, that shows us kind of the power of that spiritual realm, the kind of broad possibilities for integrating and assimilating information, for coming to a deeper understanding of soul journey. It's one of the reasons why we say that these experiences are ineffable, that they cannot be put into words. Our words are great for describing a trip to Disney World, 
but they're not so great at describing a realm where we're completely elevated out of temporal flow and our normal sense of narrative to where you can experience all of your life at once and uh, come away with deep and profound lessons. Um, so to me, first of all, is acknowledging that kind of timeless nature. And the similarities uh, in these stories uh, are very remar remarkable, even though every single NDE is tailored to the individual and thus is in many ways kind of unique. Uh, and yet people who study them, like Bruce Grayson and other investigators, will tell you that there are common themes. I mean, very commonly, we, uh, you know, as I said a minute ago, one of the most uh, uh, crucial across all cultures is reuniting with souls of departed loved ones. Uh, and in many ways, you hear stories of that where it's clear that it's not just wishful thinking on the part of the person who's leaving, but uh, much more so uh, an important kind of soul lesson and teaching learning opportunity uh, from reuniting with souls of those who've passed over. I know that early on when I started giving talks about all this, before Proof of Heaven ever came out, because I started the talks two and a half years before the book came out, uh, but people would come up to me afterwards and say, I've never told anybody this before, but, and then they'd share a story with me that might have happened 50 years earlier, but it was their after-death communication, their near-death experience, their shared death experience, what have you. Uh, and they would say that the most beautiful gift their loved one ever gave them was this concrete assurance with that communication that their souls were eternal, that they were not going to come to an end. But when you're alive in this body and you have communication with a soul of a loved one who has left the physical plane and they give you information that they can only know in real time in the now to prove that they're actually now involved with you, that is a gift because that tells the recipient, my soul is eternal too. And uh, this is why, you know, these kind of experiences are such a gift. And in fact, proof of heaven uh, really took off. And what a lot of people don't realize is that a huge uh, uh, power of that book was that it resonated with people and reminded them of things that they might have forgotten. Uh, for example, Jim Tucker and Ian Stevenson, who study those children's past life memories, will tell you, you have to harvest these memories before age five or six, because after that, natural processes cover them over. So most of us as adults don't remember past lives and between lives, but they can be recovered through an NDE, through hypnotic regression, through meditation, through centering mm -hmm. prayer, spontaneous epiphany. These are all ways that our past life memories can be uh, uncovered and proof of heaven had exactly that effect. It served as a catalyst to remind literally thousands of people who contacted me. In fact, that's what the whole second book, Map of Heaven is all about, are these communications from people that, that just show how, how common this experience is. You know, near-death experiences are out there uh, by the millions. Uh, and that is what is waking this world up. But especially when viewed in the much larger context of uh, the scientific study of consciousness in the current era, that's when we start to realize there's a much bigger story to tell. And that that bleak and paltry fiction of materialism, that we're all separate beings, that it's birth to death and nothing more, uh, that fiction needs to die off because it's done tremendous damage to this world. And we need to realize we're all connected in this together. We are souls uh, in, in an eternal form of existence. And we keep coming back to these physical forms as a process of evolution of all consciousness. That's what we're contributing to. It's the growth of our understanding. And this revolution uh, is actually a cycle that's thousands of years long. I'm not just talking about a scientific revolution involving, involving a few decades of, of human thought, but it really involves thousands of years of humans trying to come to a deeper understanding of their relationship with the universe. And finally, we are getting there. Although I will uh, attribute, uh, important to point out, that much of the deep wisdom emerging from the modern science of consciousness in the form of the one mind, the binding force of love, how we're all in this together, in many ways reflects deep spiritual truths that have been part of spiritual traditions going back thousands of years, both East and West, of oneness, of this kind of spiritual force in the universe. Uh, these are the deep truths that the modern science of consciousness is now supporting fully. Yeah, you know, it seems like right now people are just starting to get it. But like you said, these have been around for thousands of years. But, you know, there's a lot of factors that get in the way 
of these truths being highlighted, you know, through politics, control, dogma, all those things. And both growing up religious, I think we could attest to this. I mean, you look at the, the, the uh, teachings of Jesus, reincarnation was there, and I think it was taken away in around, what, two or 300 AD um, by the um, for con- you know, con- Council of Constantine. Constantine and the Council of yeah, Nicaea. so it's just, you know, Judaism, Kabbalistic teachings is very strong, but it's just kind of like hidden and just driven away, and it's more so focused on rule bound. And that, again, that belief system that you have to follow a certain rules to get to God has, you know, influenced lives versus saying that God is not outside yourselves. God is not in dogma. God is in love. And right. I think if more people were to awaken to that, it would be fascinating. Uh, one, of my, one of my last questions for you is I know you referenced a lot of sacred acoustics from Karen, and I listened to it myself. Uh, but for the average person, like, what, what have you gained from meditation? What has it brought you in your life? And how could that translate to this divine connection of the other side of eternity? You know, there's many forms of it you hear from mindfulness, transcendental, but really, how can meditation allow someone to just experience this greater part of themselves? What could the average person do? Because I know you have a wonderful daily practice. So, Eben, what um, is your micro and macro viewpoints of meditation? Because I know you have a wonderful, rich daily practice. But for those who haven't crossed over or died, how could meditation translate itself to remembering the eternity of the soul? What has it brought to you personally? How could the average person benefit from it from a broader perspective? Well, I I will start by saying after my coma, I ended up reading about 150 books over two years on science of consciousness, (laughs) physics, uh, all kinds of spiritual traditions, East and West, trying to come up with some answers. And I finally realized that the only way to get answers was really to explore my own consciousness. I had to develop a practice of meditation. Uh, I was used to a form of meditation called Silva Mind Control that I used in college. Uh, That was when I was at University of North Carolina on the parachute team. And we used to use Silva Mind Control before jumps to help us do free formation dives and do them a lot better by having that meditation before. However, for some reason, I didn't see the value of meditation uh, moving forward. I didn't continue it, but I sure did beginning about two years post coma. And I was especially attracted to binaural beat brainwave entrainment. Binaural beats are a phenomenon first described in the mid 1800s by a Prussian physicist. He found that a pure tone in one ear and a slightly different tone in the other ear generates a signal in the brain of this kind of modulated wavering wah, 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 like that, that's equal to the arithmetic difference between the two input tones. The reason that's important is by using uh, this kind of slight difference uh, in frequencies to the two ears in these meditative tones, you'll find that it has a powerful effect on the lower brainstem. And any form of hypnosis uh, has, u- has in general used some kind of oscillation in the lower brainstem. People are used to seeing a pendulum waving, and that means the eyes are moving. That's what's driving this oscillation of the brainstem. EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, very effective treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. Similarly, uses circuits in the midbrain, oscillating back and forth with eye movements to allow people to get into a deep transcendental conscious state. Now, with sacred acoustics, we're actually going much lower in the brainstem, so a more primitive part of fostering even greater power, kind of allowing the conscious awareness to be set free. Uh, And that's where I think the power comes from. So I started using uh, these forms of differential frequency brainwave instrument like sacred acoustics way back about two years post coma. And that's where I started having uh, these experiences and where I, I was sensing, you know, for many people, meditation is ruined because their little voice in their head, the linguistic brain, won't shut up. It keeps, you know, anxiety, fear, you know, shopping lists, uh, you know, mimicking uh, discussions uh, to be made in the future, et cetera, et cetera. That's what that little uh, ego voice in the head is so busy doing. Also telling you whatever you're trying to do, you're doing it wrong. You know, those kind of messages. So it's important to let that little ego voice, it can make a statement, uh, make a request, but then it goes into timeout. And I, I love reminding people that Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul, he calls that voice in your head, your annoying roommate. That's mm-hmm. it. 
So it's not your consciousness. Your consciousness is your awareness of that voice. And your conscious awareness is the part of you that expands tremendously uh, when the brain and body die. And, and the brain and body dying is also the end of that ego, of that linguistic brain. But it's not the end of your soul and that awareness. That's the part that expands tremendously. Uh, and just like in Tibetan dream work, where you use lucid dreaming uh, taught by teachers uh, as, so that as you uh, work towards you know, the dying process, you're very used to the concept of your conscious awareness being separate from your brain and body. Uh, likewise, in this kind of meditation, you can start developing uh, that kind of uh, awareness of existence that doesn't uh, just exist in the here now in the sense of self. And that's where I think meditation can be especially powerful uh, and for me, I've learned to let the little uh, linguistic voice of Eben Alexander's ego make a statement, a request, what have you. But then I've learned to ride the tones and just focus on my breathing and just follow those tones that I'm listening to through headphones. That's the best way to get the maximum power out of sacred acoustics and, or, or any form of binaural beats. And I would also advise people, not all binaural beats are created equal. Uh, and there, there are apps out there where you can generate your own binaural beats and things like that. But what you'll find is it's much better to have a, a, an expert like Karen, uh, Karen Newell and her uh, uh, business partner and audio engineer, Ke Kevin Cossey. Um, he's the one who composes these sounds, but, but none of them would exist without Karen's uh, incredible uh, input to make them into the powerful tones that they are. Uh, but uh, certainly credit to Kevin for being a maestro at being able to generate uh, these uh, very powerful tones. And if you go to sacredacoustics.com, you'll find a wide repertoire of possible listening. And not only that, but it's an instructive website where she has one page, for example, I want to dot, 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 and the many things that people come to meditation to do and all the many options there. And she has very specific recommendations uh, for which uh, which products will help get you there. Uh, but you don't have to put down any money at all. You can just go there, leave your name and uh, email address, and you get a 20-minute OM file. Listen to it through headphones. It's all free. Uh, and that's very powerful. I will also point out that Sacred Acoustics was proven in a peer-reviewed scientific study published in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in September, I'm sorry, in uh, uh, January of 2020. Uh, and that particular article by Dr. Anna Yusum found a 26% reduction in anxiety symptoms over two weeks in her very busy Manhattan psychiatric practice. Uh, so relief of anxiety, very powerful over two weeks, compared to only 7% reduction in the control group that only received talk therapy, but no sacred acoustics tone. So uh, just in terms of getting rid of anxiety, that's a very powerful uh, result, especially to come from a non-pharmacologic method, like just listening to these sounds through headphones. Um, and that bundle that was uh, the source material for that article is available at a discounted price on Sacred Acoustics. It's called the Whole Mind Bundle. Uh, and I think Karen Loke, uh, lowered the price to something like $19. And in fact, because of the pandemic, uh, she knew there was a lot of anxiety out in this world. And so she even included a free option, uh, which I think is still available uh, on sacredacoustics.com. So people can download that uh, whole mind bundle for free if they're in any kind of financial hardship uh, in the mm -hmm. moment. Uh, and Karen just offered that out of the generosity of her heart to help this world, to help relieve the anxiety out there by giving out this very powerful and scientifically validated tool uh, in the form of the whole mind bundle. Highly recommend checking them out, and I know I've used them myself, and you make a great point. From one end of, end of ear to another one, it's meditation, I feel, is intimacy with the eternity. It helps you to get in touch with that sacred, eternal observer, not the absorber, and that's the difference. No matter what, you just know there's this part of you that goes beyond thought, beyond emotion, beyond time. My final question for you is Dr. Eben Alexander is totally – you know, different than some of the trajectory of our questions, which has to do with, um, you know, I, as a therapist, I really study a lot of regrets that people have towards end of life, and they have all these studies. And one of those regrets, you know, that people have is, 
you know, being fearful of what others think of them and living a life to impress other people or being someone else's version of who they want you to be instead of being who you were meant to be. And you're someone who walks the talks. I mean, you've taken, you know, the shots to the chin from the skeptics and have come through from this medical background and have gone on Oprah, Larry King, from my understanding. Like, where did you gather the strength, you know, with everything that was going against you from your medical background, everything that you worked up to? How did you do that? And how could you speak to people who have maybe a dream inside of them? They have this voice, they have this story but they're afraid to share it. They're afraid to tell it because you've walked the talk and then some. What piece of advice would you give? Well, I would say, first of all, as a scientist, uh, once I realized uh, the reality of the journey, and I, I, I was my own worst skeptic at the beginning. You know, when I woke up from coma, I was my brain was so addled, I did not recognize my loved ones, mothers, sisters, sons at the bedside. I had no idea who they were. So you need to understand just how badly wrecked my brain was at the beginning. And then as I came out of all this and I was trying to tell my doctors about it, they would pat me on the back and say, your brain was very, very sick. It was soaking in pus. In fact, we have no idea how you're coming back to us now. Mm -hmm. But you can forget about all that because the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. So I took my doctors for their word. Yeah, okay, so dying brain plays tricks. To me, it was astonishing. I mean, these memories would not go away. This incredible experience was burned into my memory. So, of course, I was recording it. I'm paying attention to it. I knew there was something to it. Uh, and I was also discovering as I went just how ill I was. Because when I first came out of coma, of course, I had no idea the medical evidence of how ill I was. And the more I uncovered about that, the more I realized, well, wait a minute. This brain was in no shape to have any kind of dream or hallucination. So how did this all happen? Uh, and the more I, I got into it, the more I recognized, of course, the many features of this. Um, and then that picture of, uh, uh, that was sent to me in the mail four months post coma that concerned my adoption history that yeah. helped me to close the loop. All that was very, very important. Uh, and once that occurred, I knew I had to share the story no matter what. To me, I was thinking about it as a scientific paper. Uh, refuting the materialist principles of, of brain creates consciousness. But I came to realize it was a far bigger message than that. Now, an important uh, uh, ingredient uh, to my courage in all this was I also was communicating with other scientists around the world. And I found that there were a large number of scientists who study this phenomenon of consciousness beyond bodily death. Um, if you go to BigelowInstitute.org, you'll find a lot of those scientists who I discovered have written articles that are right there on that BigelowInstitute.org website. Uh, but I communicate with a lot of them. In fact, there's, uh, there are uh, kind of groups of communication by email, et cetera, uh, that connect these uh, group, scientific uh, groups of, across a broad range of interests. And that's where I found that my support in the scientific community was actually quite large. Once people realized the scientific validity of my story, uh, and you know there had been attempts in the lay press to kind of take me down with ad hominem attacks and things like that, that uh, 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 tried to impugn my neurosurgical career, things like that, so that people would think they couldn't trust me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know those very cheap uh, ad hominem attacks. Hit uh, unfortunately, you know they had some effect, and there are people who only read that and then never had an interest in reading Evan Alexander's story again, which is sad to me because I think it can be so helpful to so many people. And yet the good news is the scientific community uh, greatly supports me and my story. Uh, GalileoCommission.org, scientificandmedical.net. Those are two websites of scientific groups that I work with. I'm on the scientific advisory board for both of them. And you will see when you read the material on those websites that this is a scientific revolution that's absolutely in progress. No question about it. And the evidence all leads in one direction. It's towards the primacy of consciousness. Uh, and this is a very kind of liberating and refreshing message for all of humanity. It will help us to get back on course as proper stewards of this planet and to take care of each other as we should be doing. Uh, these are all the deepest lessons from NDEs, but the science of consciousness broadly supports them. And this is where I think the world is waking up. Uh, and it's just in the nick of time because no question, our addiction to fossil fuels, our polluting the world with plastics, et cetera, 
uh, is leading to uh, extinction of many species of life on Earth, and that is a tragedy of immense proportions. It's high time we woke up and to save this planet, save ourselves, save our souls, uh, and come to realize uh, that we, we have a gift here in this beautiful uh, planet Earth, and we need to treasure it and take care of it and take care of each other. People need to get clear with the facts on all accounts, you know, so absolutely. Well, Dr. Abed, Evan Alexander, you're a gem to the world. You're brilliant mind, heart, and spirit, and you're someone who I certainly know has changed the world with the fact, you know, and the world is a better place because you're here and we're so lucky that you came back and have, you know, shed this light and continue to influence lives on a countless base on a daily basis. Is there any um, last messages that you have to share as well as how can people find some of your wonderful best-selling books, which I highly recommend, you know, and any upcoming projects or workshops? We know that there's no end, but we want, I wanted to know maybe what's a little bit around the corner for Dr. Evan Alexander. Could you, uh, you know, shed a little bit of light on that before we depart uh, today? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I'll point out to uh, the books Proof of Heaven, Map of Heaven, and Living in a Mindful Universe are the three main books about all of this. Uh, you can learn a lot more at ebenalexander.com. That's E-B-E-N alexander.com. Uh, especially, I recommend the reading list there. Uh, it's categorized and uh, many hot links to active scientific papers, etc. But it's a very useful reading list for people who really want to go, go deep into all this. Also, the FAQ page uh, answers many questions that are commonly asked by people about my experience and about my story at large. Uh, and then, of course, there are many interviews and presentations with the links on ebonalexander.com. For those who want to get into the meditation, sacredacoustics.com. As I said, explore that website. You'll have to find it very instructive uh, about meditation at large. Um, I, also, I can recommend innersanctumcenter.com. That's I-N-N-E-R sanctumcenter.com. Uh, and that's a, a host of several different offerings of information um, that Karen and I have provided, especially a set of interviews we did during the pandemic uh, with uh, global thought leaders on consciousness. Uh, those interviews are there available for free to the viewing public. Uh, innersanctumcenter.com, very important resource. Uh, and I would just remind people this, uh, this revolution in, in, in consciousness uh, is all about no soul left behind. The scientific mm -hmm. world is rapidly getting there, but you don't have to wait for them to get on board. Uh, get into meditation, start following this literature, follow our kind of websites and ideas. Uh, get going now with your own personal revolution uh, because this is all leading us into a far more refreshing and liberating a version of ourselves. Uh, that's what this is all about, is coming to know the true meaning and purpose of our existence. Uh, and this kind of awakening, I think, is imperative for any of us who claim to be a true seeker. So yes. best wishes to all of your listeners and viewers uh, and uh, no soul left behind. So we're all in this together. An honor for having you on, as a guest in the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. And your revolution, as Evan says, will help out the evolution and it was my great honor to be talking heaven with Evan and keep up the great work. Thank you for all that you do. You and you're, you do. you're a welcome guest at any time. And thank Karen as well for her wonderful contribution. So thank you. I will do Papa. that for sure. Thanks so much for having me on, Jacob. Thank you all for tuning in to my interview with Dr. Evan Alexander. He not only gave, you know, what's to come and what heaven is about, but also and as one of his books says, you know, a map way and a gateway to heaven. So we learned so much, you know, from Eben, from its scientific perspective to higher consciousness to spiritual. He really covered a lot of different angles. And as someone who has certainly transformed, you know, from a skeptic, having a near-death experience, and now is a, is, is a profound luminary, you know, within his spiritual teachings to the planet. So we are so thankful for having Dr. Eben Alexander on episode 19. Make sure you subscribe, you know, for more future content and interviews coming your way on the Wisdom Jacob's Ladder so you could get up to date, you know, and stay on top of things. Next week, episode number 20, we're going to be having on Karen Noe, who is a wonderful medium, intuitive, psychic, and she will also talk about her channeling work 
of Dr. Wayne Dyer. So you don't want to miss my interview coming up with Karen, no Karen Noe happening here on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Thank you all for tuning in. Stay in touch. Many blessings to all. Thank you.